So big news earlier on today, Uber's application to renew their license with the London Transport Authority was rejected. Their present license expires on the 30th of September. They have a couple of weeks to appeal. Why did this happen? They were viewed as not really behaving in a way that was uh, adequate for such a large company. They hadn't exhibited sufficient corporate responsibility, hadn't taken seriously a case of sexual assault, hadn't vetted their workers properly. And there was a minor element, albeit inarguable, uh, element within their ranks of criminal behavior in a range of areas, uh, which wasn't taken seriously by the company. They hadn't behaved appropriately. So they've not had their license renewed. If they don't get it renewed, if the appeal doesn't work, they won't be able to do business in London very soon. Now, clearly, Uber weren't happy about this. Their response was to say that 3.5 million users in London will be angry. The 40,000 workers who work for them, who have invested significant time and often money into driving for Uber, they're going to be angry too, which is correct. And the left seems to have taken one of two responses. On the one hand, people have said, fantastic. This is you know, a blow to the gig economy, hyper-exploited workers. This isn't the way we should do things. They should be unionised, uh, you know, they should be organised properly, like we have, for instance, with uh, underground workers. The other argument is, this is 40,000 people who potentially lost their livelihood. Uh, again, precarious, low pay. And what's more, some people do need to use Uber. They can't afford black cabs, and it could be women or people who could be subject to uh, abuse or violence at particular times, and they want to have that mode of transport, and it's affordable. Okay? And that's a very strong, compelling argument. It's also correct. Nobody is wrong here. The people that are saying this is good are right, and the people that say these 40,000 people need jobs are also right. Fundamentally, the only real solution in the long term, structurally, politically, is to nationalise Uber. That's right. TfL needs to have its own version of the app, owned by the people and for the people. You see, Uber's claim about this being bad for workers is a load of garbage to start with. Yes, 40,000 people are going to see their jobs potentially eliminated, but Uber's end game is not to give people work. Uber have 400 people working in a Pittsburgh research centre, uh, working almost exclusively around issues of automation. Uber want to establish a monopoly when it comes to the taxi industry globally. They want to establish that monopoly. They want to automate the industry, so they'll have a lower cost. They'll be the default uh, choice for consumers around the world and then they will automate most of, if not all, of their fleet. And that's quite clearly in their corporate plans. Their previous CEO, uh, uh, Trevor Kalanick, had talked about it. This is all on record, okay? They want to establish that monopoly and, and then take it from there. And this is how platform capitalism works. We see it with Facebook. You can only have one Facebook, otherwise what's the point? You can only have one Google, otherwise what's the point? Same with Uber. Uber wants to be the default monopoly private transporter of every major city and town in the world, and finally it was going to be automated. So the stuff about job creation is nonsense. Fundamentally, Uber is a machine, a bit like Amazon, to extract wealth from places, and they don't even create any work in return in the long term. Because once we get automated vehicles, that is Uber's plan. It's about extracting value and giving it to Uber shareholders. This is a machine to capture value, not create it, and give it to a very, very select few. So what should be the response? Well, I think in the short term, TfL should create their own app. How difficult can it be? We already have the workers. We already have the capital, i.e. the cars. Uh, it's clear that TfL, in a very short space of time, could probably create uh, a TfL-controlled Uber uh, with unionised workers, uh, with pay which was living wage and, you know, good, strong employee rights, pensions, sick pay, holidays. That's what should happen in the short to medium term. We should have a people's Uber. In the longer term, as I've said, we are moving increasingly to very high levels of automation and logistics, not just with taxis and autonomous vehicles, but also with drones, with you know, trucks, with anything that moves. The warehousing robots, it will all be automated. One of the real leading edges of what's going to happen in automation in the next two decades. So as we move to that, what we're going to have is essentially a 24-hour logistical internet we will have driverless, autonomous vehicles moving goods and people everywhere constantly. Now, in that context, that's a bigger argument even for public ownership. Because as the amount of human labour is diminished, that needs to be subordinated to human need, not to private profit. So we need a people's Uber. And as we see automation over time, we need 
fewer and fewer people working in that sector, but that shouldn't mean fewer jobs. It should mean fewer hours and the same, if not more pay. And there's even an argument that says, well, look, you won't need a TFO controlled fleet of autonomous vehicles in 20 or 30 years time. And by the way, all the cars will be running electric and electricity by then. It will be coming, like I've said so many times before, from solar. By the early 2020s, if the trends at present are correct on energy storage with lithium-ion batteries, if the trends are correct with what we're going to see from wind and solar by the middle of the next decade, electric cars will replace petrol cars within 10 years as the cheaper option. And as those batteries become ever more efficient, as I've said before, we see permanently deflationary tendencies in regard to energy where it moves to zero marginal cost we see permanently deflationary tendencies in terms of how these cars are created increasingly automated labor uh, modular labor 3d printing of prototypes and so on that should mean effectively zero marginal cost transport so the vision 30 40 years from now will be effectively you know free at the point of use uh, transport infrastructures in fact i think it'd be far sooner than that and what's more, the average car doesn't actually move 95% of the time, which means you have a huge surplus of capacity there, which is unused. Perhaps those cars would also be able to plug into an automated logistical internet. Regardless, we can have post-scarcity in transport. Anybody can get anywhere whenever they want for free. But we don't need private enterprise to do that. We need fully automated luxury communism.